Who of you ever heard of the name Timothy Ferris? Please raise your hands. Okay. Who of you knows the law of Parkinson? Mm -hmm. Who is familiar with the Eisenhower matrix? Great. And who knows the Pareto principle or the 80-20 rule? Ah. And who is tired after sitting and me being the fifth speaker and the only thing between you and the lunch break? <laughs> you don't need to raise your hands. So please stand up. Let's loosen up a little bit. Shake your right hand, shake your left hand, shake your feet, stretch a little bit. Don't hit your neighbors, but in case anything happens, there's a doctor in the room, right? <laughs> okay, you can sit down, please. Thank you. When I was 20 years old, a friend of mine gave me a book by Timothy Ferris, The Four-Hour Work Week. This book and the three principles should change my life forever. And I promise at the end of this speech, it will hopefully change your life too. Imagine being a doctor. You have a patient, she comes to you, 50 year old, and she has a problem and needs to meet a specialist. I had this conversation three days ago with a colleague of mine. He told me about his 50 year old female patient who needed to meet a specialist very desperately. She needed to wait six months for her appointment. Sounds familiar, right? So after six months, she went to the specialist. She got diagnosed with breast cancer, which had already spread into her lymph nodes. You probably know the earlier you start the treatment, the better the outcome and the higher chance of survival. Our healthcare system is in a crisis. How would you describe the situation? I would say it's not really good. In the next 10 years, 13 million people in Germany will go into retirement, the so-called baby boomers. This is a huge impact it will have on our society. We will have less healthcare workers that could provide help when you need it. This means around 30% of the healthcare workers will not be there in the next 10 years. Furthermore, we are getting older as a society. People are getting older. Life expectancy is on the rise, which is a very good thing. You have more time to spend with your children, with your grandchildren. You can enjoy life, travel around the world, and have a good, long, and healthy life. But that means also that you need more treatments. The reason why our life expectancy is on the rise is our great healthcare system, but at the same time, we need more treatments. So we would actually need more healthcare workers, not less. So this puts a lot of pressure on the system and the situation will worsen. And on top of that, energy costs are exploding. Inflation is on the run. Medication is not available, no antibiotics. 
costs are so high that 75% of hospitals are in the red, which a recent, recent study showed. Many of them are facing bankruptcy. Realistic estimation expect 20 to 30 percent of our hospitals in Germany to shut down in the next decade. <laughs> this is a disaster. Imagine visiting your parents on a Sunday evening. Your mom has prepared your favorite meal. You're having a great time chatting with your parents, and suddenly your father doesn't feel good. He has trouble breathing. His chest feels very uncomfortable. He grabs his left shoulder. He's having a heart attack. So you run as fast as possible, get him in the car, and drive to the nearest hospital, which is only 10 minutes away from your home. You arrive there in no time, and you want to get him in. But it's dark. The lights are out. The hospital just shut down last week. You look up. Where is the next hospital? 30 minutes drive to the next town. 30 minutes that can decide between life and death. I studied medicine at the Charité in Berlin, one of the most renowned medical schools in Europe. I traveled around the world. I had multiple internships in different countries and in stations like in Harvard, Cape Town, and Zurich. I wanted to be able to learn from the best doctors around the world, to be enabled to provide the best healthcare possible to my patient, to you, and to your loved ones. I worked over eight years as a practicing doctor and specialized in radiology. And what I noticed during my medical studies and my work in over two decades we had less and less time for our patients, and we were spending more and more time on additional organizational tasks, like taking notes, documenting everything, writing and printing letters, delivering CDs, using fax machines, and always on the phone. I hate this phone. <laughs> it kept you away from the patients. I love treating patients. I want to talk to them. I want to feel their pain, feel their needs, and help them. But I was taken away by all the other stuff that we needed to do for hours. So, with the major problems on my mind and the daily routine that my colleagues and I are facing, I wondered, I am not able to do anything in the situation I am. I don't know the things I need to know. I'm not enabled. And with the work I'm doing, I'm not able to change anything. So I needed a new skill set. And I thought about pursuing an MBA to get the financial education necessary for this task to be solved. Imagine being a young doctor on your track of specialization, married, having two small children. The financial and personal responsibility is very high. So, alongside a full-time job, a small family, it wouldn't be considered very smart to make this decision of an MBA. But then I thought about my children. What do I want to tell them 
when they grow up and they ask me, what did you do? What did you do to change the situation, although you saw the consequences and you saw the crisis and you saw what we were leading to? This is when I decided that I want to get an MBA. But not any MBA. I picked the WHU, Otto Beisheim School of Management, one of the best business schools in Europe, to be equipped with the necessary skill set to get this task done. So I took the jump, took the leap of faith and jumped. Coming back to our problem. Our healthcare system has exploding costs and lack of personal, of healthcare workers. So our politicians are really working hard to try to find solutions. What would be a typical and valid solution? As we know, financial stable hospital is very important. So proper funding would be a very good idea. But although we are trying to get more money into the hospital system, it's not enough. Hospitals are closing down. It won't be sufficient to solve it with more money. And the second problem, we don't have healthcare workers. Let's get more people. But as I said, we already have a lack of healthcare workers and it will worsen. So, I worked really, really hard this summer to come up with a solution. <laughs> oh, wrong picture. <laughs> I worked really, really hard this summer to come up with a solution and develop new ideas how we could solve this problem. So, I was walking in my room when I saw my bookshelf and I saw the book of Timothy Ferris, The Four Hour Work Week. And I remembered the three principles I told you about. Number one, the law of Parkinson. I hope you can read it. As I'm a doctor, you know. <laughs> so the law of Parkinson says that tasks extend to the time available. You probably know that. You have a task in university. It needs to be done in one uh, month. You have all the plans, how you want to pl plan every week, and then suddenly, three days before deadline, you know, okay, we will just focus, we get everything done, and on the last day, just in time, you finish the task. That's the powerful law of Parkinson. Anybody knows it? I'm, I'm really into that. Number two, the 80-20 rule. 20% of the work lead to 80% of the result. So, the key is to find out which 20% will lead to the 80% of the result. Because to get to 100, you need to do all the additional work. And the third thing is the Eisenhower matrix, which divides tasks in urgent, non-urgent, important, and non-important tasks. These are the things you want to care about, important and urgent. These are the ones you want to get to delegate. So, wouldn't it be great to have a way to get rid of the 80% of the work? So, I met many startups, ambitious people, very smart people, who try to find solutions for this matter. 
technology is your friend, as we learned, and it will be possible to find solutions so we can focus more on the patient and not on the work that should be delegated or deleted. I remember when I was driving my friend back home, I was still deciding whether I wanted to decide to go into MBA or not. I was driving him home and I was afraid. Am I really wanting to take that step? And in that car, in that moment, my friend said one thing that stuck with me. He said, if you don't do it, who else will? We as doctors won't be able to solve this alone. We need architects, designers, engineers, programmers, data scientists. Everyone in this room has a skill set that could help us to find solutions for these tasks to be eliminated and delegated. So, like my friend asked me back then in the car, I'm asking you today. If you don't do it, who else will? <laughs>